Thank you for joining us for this MDA Engage Community Webinar on Frederick Sataxia. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. We are thrilled to have you join us today for this important and educational webinar. The webinar today is part of our larger Engage flagship community event series, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual education events. We are recording today's event and will be posting it on the mda.org website for on-demand viewing to ensure that those who are not able to join to us live today are able to access this information. Please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. Please be sure to to utilize the Q&A window to type your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A bubble to open the window and enter your question. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. As questions come up along the webinar, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our speaker whom you will meet shortly. The Muscular Dystrophy Association is committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases. We do this through innovations in care and innovations in science. MDA's reach with research is vast. MDA is the largest non-governmental funder of neuromuscular research in the country. To share a little bit specifically to MDA's work in the FA research landscape, MDA has invested more than $400,000 on FA grants in 2019. In 2019, MDA had seven active FA grants. MDA has invested more than $2.5 million on FA grants in the last five years. Since its inception, MDA has invested more than $18 million in FA research. With that foundation, let us review the objectives for today's webinar. Participants will receive an overview of Friedrich's ataxia and learn about FA's clinical research landscape. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Subramoni directs the Adult Muscular Dystrophy Clinics at Ataxia Clinic at the University of Florida Health in Gainesville, Florida. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Dr. Subramoni. So uh, I want to thank you very much, um, and in particular, I want to thank the families and patients who are on the webinar, uh, listening to me for a while. Like always, you know, I, I like to start with a little bit of history, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, obviously still an evolving field, and, and the field is still making history. But remember that uh, you have uh, this disease was originally identified and um, figured out as a distinct disease by Nicholas Friedreich, a German physician uh, between the years 1860 and 1876. Uh, he was the first one to point out that uh, ataxias in these young children and young adults could have a genetic basis. So we, we started talking with Nicholas Friedreich and uh, his description of Friedreich's ataxia in the 1860s. And over the next hundred years, we struggled with this disease, how to distinguish it from many other types of ataxias because it turns out there are large different uh, large numbers of inherited ataxias and in the 1970s and 1980s two um, stalwart figures got into the act and you see a picture of professor andre barbeau from montreal and then professor anita harding from uh, london and both of these people worked on large families of free drugs from canada and from London, England, and were able to refine the clinical diagnosis of Friedreich's ataxia. And this was quite important because uh, that allowed to sample very clinical, uh, definite diagnosis of Friedreich's patients. And we needed that uh, to combine that with the DNA technology, which was emerging at that time, and finally able to identify the causative mutation in Friedreich's ataxia. So now we all know, and many of, many of you already know, that this mutation was published in 1996, and it is a unusual type of mutation. We call it a repeat expansion, uh, and it is a GA repeat expansion in, in Friedreich's ataxia. And so on the right side here, if you can see my cursor, 
I give you a little cartoon of a gene. Uh, for example, a gene is made up of the, the string of nucleotide molecules that are actually four molecules that make up the gene in terms of its code. Uh, it's got a promoter sequence and it's got these blue segments which are called exons. These are responsible for making proteins whereas the introns are not. They're kind of, uh, kind of in between filler DNA, if you will. It's converted into an RNA and in the case of free drugs ataxia, there is this repetitive series of nucleotides, GAA, GAA, on and on. So if you have a normal number of these repetitions, uh, you don't have any problem, but when it expands and becomes longer, uh, you get the disease. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please? So everybody is familiar with what this disease does. Uh, it causes increasing balance problems, speech problems, coordinator coordination problems. Uh, beginning usually in teenage years, sometimes later. Um, and then it causes some skeletal muscle deformities. Uh, I mean, sorry, skeletal deformities like scoliosis. Uh, it affects the heart. Um, it affects the cerebellum up here, as you can see. It also affects these nerves, the peripheral nerves. So they have a neuropathy and the, all of this causes the ataxia because they can get a cardiomyopathy. It often affects the pancreas. Can I have the next slide, please? So, we know that this is a recessive disease. So what do we mean by that? Uh, every gene that you have comes in two copies. You have a paternal copy and a maternal copy. And in the case of a recessive disease, you really need both copies to be mutated. The parents are carriers and they won't get the disease. And in the case of Friedreich's ataxia, again, here I show you this first intron of the Friedreich's gene you have a repeat called GAA. These are repetitive nucle nucleotides that are strung together like beads. Uh, and up to about 44 repeats will be quite normal. So normal individuals will have uh, fewer than 44 repeats in both alleles. But when you get both alleles beyond 44 repeats, usually 66 or more, you get the disease. For example, here you have 500 repeats in this intron. That's, that's what causes the disease. And this number is unstable. So if you count this number in different patients with free drugs ataxia, it's going to be a little bit different. So as it gets transmitted, the, the number does change. And we know now that what this does is to reduce the copying of this DNA into RNA. So it causes problems with what we call transcription, uh, which is done by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So if not enough of the messenger RNA is made, and the result is there is not enough of frataxin. So you see here on the left side, normal amount of frataxin in Friedrich's patients, that is reduced amount of frataxin. And we know that this is what causes the disease. This is the ultimate cause of the disease. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of questions that we need to answer and we have been addressing for the last 25, 30 years. First of all, how does the GA expansion cause uh, the reduced amount of frataxin. What is it about that long GA repeat that m does not allow for enough production of the RNA and enough production of the frataxin protein? And the second question is, how does the reduced amount of frataxin cause pathology and clinical symptoms? And finally, the most important question is, what can we do to correct frataxin deficiency and its consequences? So can I have the next slide, please? So, um, like everything in medicine and with uh, COVID news all the time on TV, people realize that things are quite complex in human biology, also in any kind of biology, things are quite complex. So you never say that your knowledge is complete, but this is what we understand so far. Uh, and I'm sure that knowledge is gonna to continue to evolve. One of the things people realize very early on that when the GAA repeat becomes longer than normal, the DNA in which it is sitting starts behaving in funny ways. Uh, instead of doing a double helix, it often makes what we call triplexes and sticky DNA. So that just like a, a long thread of, a, a long string of thread which can get tangled up on itself. So that's what happens at the DNA level. And we think that this may have consequences because it may stall that polymerase enzyme, not allow enough RNA to be produced. In addition to that, there is a considerable amount of evidence that it causes what we call epigenetics. Now, what is that? What does that word mean? It means this, that you know, all our genes are tightly regulated. They can come on and off. So if you go to this figure on the, the bottom right corner, genes can have a green signal where the genes are working and make, making their protein. They can be regulated and go to the red side uh, where you can have gene silencing. So this happens all the time in response to all the stimuli we get. 
And there are a number of ways that genes are regulated, even in normal, normal people. And one of the regulatory mechanisms involves a protein, which is shown in a cartoon here, called histones. So there are lots of histones that cluster around genes. And if a gene is working normally, the, the histones are open. So they're kind of surrounding the promoter area of the gene, but the, but the configuration of these histones uh, is quite open. And this openness is often related to these little orange things that we call acetyl molecules that are attached to the histone. These are called acetyl tails. So an acetylation of these proteins allows for an open configuration of the gene and the gene is active. But from time to time, these, these histones can lose these tails and become clustered from what we call heterochromatin. This is a closed configuration of histones. This will silence the gene, go to the red side, if you will. And it turns out that when you have a long repeat in the GAA tract, in the first intron of the Friedreich's gene, you start getting this kind of histones. The acetylation is lost. You get uh, a, a, a formation of histone that's not permissive for gene activation. Gene gets silenced. There are many other mechanisms as well, including um, addition of methyl molecules to the histones and methylation of the, the DNA itself. And all these are still being explored, but the, 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 the acetyl, um, acetylation of histone story is the best explored in terms of why the gene gets silenced. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, so we, we, we have some idea uh, why we don't, we don't make enough rituxin when you, when you have the mutation, the GAA expansion. And you also have a fair amount of idea what happens to the cells if you don't have enough rituxin. So here on the left side, you have a complex uh, picture of a fratexin molecule. So these proteins are configured in different ways. There was a, a helical formation that are what we call beta sheets. And this all kind of, uh, the, this configuration of the protein is very important for its function. We know that the gene for Friedreich's uh, fratexin sits in the nucleus of the cells. And then the protein is made in what we call the cytoplasm. But we also know that this protein, fratexin, is targeted to these little thingies looking like little rail railroad tracks. These are called mitochondria. So fratexin, the major function of the fratexin is in the mitochondria. And what are mitochondria? So here is a blow up of what a mitochondria might look like. And what I'm going to show you here is, I call this the furnace of the cell because we need a lot of energy to do everything we do in our, in our body every day, moving, speaking, thinking, even resting requires energy, even sleeping requires energy. And that energy is made from the glucose that you eat, from the fat, fats and fatty acids that you put into your system. They eventually end up within the mitochondria. And there is this complex biochemical cycle that's called a TCA cycle, which burns up the glucose. You see the carbon dioxide are being produced, oxygen is used here. And this TCA cycle is important in uh, producing the energy as also the oxidation of fatty acids, which we call beta oxidation. So there are a couple of these metabolic cycles that are going within the mitochondria. And this feeds into a complex series of proteins that are stuck inside the mitochondrial membrane. These are called the electron transport chains. So this is a very complicated process of oxidizing fatty acids, oxidizing carbohydrates, generating um, um, hydrogen and other kinds of ions, combining it with oxygen. And the final product is this, important energy molecule called ATP. So this is what happens in mitochondria. Now, what happens with Friedreichs? We mentioned that fratexin is targeted in mitochondria. And the most important function that we have identified for, for, for fratexin is shown here. And fratexin is important in handling iron, uh, the iron that we all know about, the metal iron. And it, it handles the iron within the mitochondria to make a series of complex molecules called iron sulfur clusters, or ISCs. And what are these clusters? These clusters are proteins that need to be inserted into many enzymes that are in the, in the cycle, for example. There are also uh, proteins that are inserted into this electron transport chain. So the result of um, the lack of protection, number one, is there is reduction of the ISC clusters, which will translate into a reduction of the TCA cycle. So the furnace is not working well. It also causes problems in the electron transport chain. Again, the ATP production, there is energy failure in these cells, which causes the cell death. At the same time, because iron is not being utilized, you get iron overload in the mitochondria. So the iron is not used. And finally, if these pathways are, are, are not working well, 
the oxygen that is being supplied here will often form what we call reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, which is a word which is familiar to many people. And when you have a problem with the electron transport chain, you generate a lot more oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species than normally. So there is increased oxidative stress, there is energy failure. And curiously enough, we also find that the cells normally pull out a defense mechanism against oxidative stress. But in Friedreich's ataxia, this oxidative stress uh, defense mechanisms are impaired. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is kind of a summary. So you have the GAA expansion leads to silencing of the frataxin gene. Not enough frataxin is produced. When that happens, not enough iron sulfur clusters are synthesized. The enzymes that use these iron sulfur clusters are deficient. These enzymes are important for electron transport. They're important for burning up carbohydrates and lipids. This results in energy failure, and this energy failure, of course, is not good for your neurons and cells, which are affected in Friedreich's ataxia. And the impaired electron transport generates oxidative stress. And the excess ion also generates oxidative stress. At the same time, there seems to be an abnormality of oxidative defense mechanism, and we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Can I have the next slide, please? So having understood all that, we can conceptualize the way we can try and treat Friedrich's ataxia. And I, I kind of classify the approaches into two types. One is what I call targeting the downstream pathways, the oxidative stress and, and similar mechanisms. We can reduce the oxidative stress. We can improve the oxidative defense mechanisms, try to get rid of the excess iron, which may be responsible for some of the oxidative stress. So these are some of the downstream strategies that have already been tried in Friedrich's ataxia, still being tried. But we can also go to the very source of the problem. We can replace the gene. That would clearly be very effective if we can do it well. Now everybody has heard of the capability of gene editing. Uh, enzymes like CRISPR-Cas can be used potentially. Um, this is still being developed. We know much about the epigenetics and other ways that the gene is shut down. And maybe we have a way to reactivate the genes by influencing these mechanisms. We can replace the protein and so on and so forth. I do believe that going to the source and finding an effective therapy in this area is going to be more effective than targeting a downstream pathway. Can I go to the next slide, please? But I will talk a little about what has happened in the downstream pathways because uh, many of these trials came up quite early in Friedrich's ataxia simply because the molecules um, that can target these uh, oxidative stress, for example, are uh, we, were, we already knew about many of these molecules. Many of them are nutri nutrient supplements. Uh, they are uh, drugs that are all already available in the market. So many trials were done. For example, if you look at this picture here, here's the mitochondria. These pink dots are the excessive ion because this ion is not being used. Here is the electron transport chain uh, problems giving rise to ROS and energy failure. Drugs like coenzyme Q10 and idibinon are able to kind of help this energy process here and maybe reduce the, uh, the oxidative stress. Um, you can chelate the ion, for example, using deferiprone. There are these molecules that have been tried that are called ROS scavengers, which are able to kind of mop up uh, these toxic oxygen molecules and try to help the oxidative stress. And finally, the oxidative defense mechanisms. It turns out that in Friedreich's ataxia, we have identified two pathways uh, that protect the cells against oxidative stress. Um, and these pathways, basically what they do, for example, is um, one is called the PGC1 alpha PPA or gamma pathway. So when the cell is exposed to oxidative stress, these pathways get activated because the cells have fantastic mechanisms for protecting themselves. So this pathway, for example, when it is activated, it increases mitochondrial biogenesis. It makes more mitochondria. The NRF2 pathway, on the other hand, when uh, in response to oxidative stress, will activate certain genes, and these genes will make antioxidant proteins like glutathione within the cells. So these are all mechanisms that have been uh, worked out in Friedreich's ataxia. Can I have the next slide, please? So the earlier trials in Friedreich's ataxia, uh, beginning in the 1990s, primarily involved uh, in early 2000 involved antioxidant strategies. For example, CoQ10 was tried in a fairly um, a, a small number of studies. 
did not have a neurological effect. Now, CoQ10 is not absorbed very well. It does not enter the brain very well. So a lot of problems with this drug, but it was tried because it was so easily available. Most people believe that this does not cause a whole lot of side effects. Uh, as many of you know, Idibinon was uh, 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 given to large numbers of patients, about 500 patients in different studies. The largest experience of antioxidant was with Idibinon. It is a CoQ10 analog, but it is smaller in size. It's absorbed better. It probably has a better function within the mitochondria than CoQ10 does. But the results of these large-scale studies uh, were conflicting. Uh, many of these studies, or all, all trials, usually identify a primary outcome measure. This is what we're going to do with the trial. And in all of these trials, we noticed that the primary outcome measure was not met. It was not satisfied. Uh, and uh, none of the regulatory agencies approved idibinon for friedrichsataxia. Uh, a couple of other drugs, this is a small study uh, where again, the primary outcome measure was not met. Um, and there has been an open label study of vitamin B1, thiamine, uh, which seems to help this energetic process within the mitochondria. The SARA score is a measure of neurological function. It is a neurological examination score. Many of you who participate in research often get these measurements done by a neurologist, either SARA score or MFARS or FARS examination. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, as you can see, there are a couple of these uh, ROS scavengers. Uh, and as you notice, these are kind of uh, nutritional sort of products. Uh, EGB761 uh, is derived from ginkgo biloba, and uh, this is, seems to be a product of gut microbes. Again, a very little benefit uh, was derived from these, uh, from these small studies. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, um, one of the things that we know is that when you have uh, oxygen toxicity, so-called uh, reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, this can damage many things in cells. It can damage proteins, it can damage nucleic acids, it can damage lipids. And one of the strategies that is now being done in a trial is to protect a lipid peroxidation. Can we at least protect the lipids? So lipids, uh, which, are, which you get from your fat in your diet, and synthesized in the cells, of course, in a, uh, are very important for maintaining the cell wall and all kinds of other functions. And it turns out that if you take a fatty acid like linoleic acid and replace the hydrogen with an isotope called deuterium, so deuterium is basically hydrogen with a different number of electrons, or, uh, if I remember right. So, so if you change it into deuterium, it, is, it seems to protect against lipid peroxidation. So that's the basis of this trial. Uh, it's called RT001, uh, done by a, a pharmaceutical company called uh, Retrotrope. And this trial is ongoing. Uh, as you see, uh, we anticipate recruiting 60 subjects. The recruitment is almost finished. Uh, you have a, uh, two arms. One is a placebo arm. The other is a treated arm. And these patients are going to be followed for almost a year. And then the primary outcome that we are looking at is cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is a bike test where we measure oxygen and workload. and uh, carbon dioxide and so on and so forth, but we'll be looking at neurological function and all the other things that we often look at in you know, activities of daily living score. So this trial is still ongoing, uh, but many of the other antioxidant strategies have been tried and kind of had uh, somewhat very mixed results, not enough to provide uh, approval. Can I have the next slide, please? I want to come back, come to uh, more exciting news, and that is so uh, as I mentioned before, these are downstream pathways. And to some extent, I'm not very surprised that when you target downstream pathways, the effect is not very much. Neurological diseases are quite difficult. They, they, you know, they're lungs, they're, they're very chronic, they damage the nervous system. So uh, it needs to be, uh, these are difficult diseases to treat, but um, the strategy that people are now uh, thinking about is to enhance the defense against uh, oxidative stress. And we mentioned two pathways that the cell uses. One is called the PPA or gamma pathway, which increases mitochondrial biogenesis. It increases the amount of mitochondria that you, that you get. So you know, this is the PPA or gamma pathway. So when something happens in the cell, this uh, the reactive oxygen species build up and this pathway goes in and starts making more mitochondria. Um, uh, and one of the trials that is going on is uh, using a drug called Lariglitazone also called MIN-102. This is an early phase trial. I don't have too much details. Uh, the, the, the safety of this compound is being established in a trial in Europe, uh, and I hear good things about it. So we'll see what happens with this trial with Larry Glitterson, but still driving at a, a downstream pathway. 
Uh, on this side of the ocean, uh, we've had uh, strategies to activate the NRF2 pathway, and uh, resveratrol uh, is one compound which is in a small study, uh, but I want to talk about the study with a drug called omavalexone or omav RTA408. Can I go to the next slide, please? So, um, RTA408 uh, is a uh, activator of NRF2, and uh, um, so since there is a problem with the NRF2 activation in free drugsotexia, a number of preclinical studies were done looking at what this compound does uh, to free drugsotexia models and, uh, and cell systems. And I just give you an example of one of these studies done in London. And what this shows are these are two different mouse models of free drugsotexia. These are patient cells. And this NADH pool that you see here, this is, uh, this is a measure of the ATP energy production here. And what you see in these mouse models is a reduction in the energy production in the NADH pool. And when you treat it with OMAO, it gets back to near normal. As you can see, this is another model, a different model, and you see the same thing. And these are patient cells, normal cells. Uh, again, a fair amount of NADH pool. This is reduced by more than 50% in patient cells. It gets even worse if you expose it to hydrogen peroxide, but when you give it OMAO, it tends to get better. Now, one of the things that is not shown in this slide, when you do these benchwork experiments, when you give OMA in increasing doses, you get a better and better effect. But after a certain dose, if you increase the dose further, it actually goes back. It, it, it kind of, the, the effect goes away and you, you actually do not get the positive effect if you go beyond a certain dose. So there is this funny looking dose response curve with OMA. Because of the results of the OMAO in preclinical studies, it, uh, it's, uh, we started with a, uh, an initial trial, which was a dose ranging trial, uh, uh, basically trying to figure out the dose of OMAO. And uh, there were a total of uh, 48 patients. So it's a very pretty small trial. It, it, they were uh, divided into placebo group as well as treated group. The treated group, as you can see, had uh, ascending doses 5, 40, 80, 160, 300 milligrams per day of the OMAO. And what this picture here shows, if you can see my cursor, is a measurement of a liver enzyme called GGT in serum. And it turns out that the, this, if you activate the NRF2 pathway, it turns on the gene for GGT in the liver and the GGT level goes up. And you see what happens with increasing doses of OMAO, you get an increasing level of GGT in the blood. And then when you get it at 300, just like in the benchworks experiments, the, the level falls off. And in parallel with this, what you see here is uh, uh, what we call the MFAR score. This is a neurological score of severity of disease. The trial lasted 12 weeks and you see multiple doses. And what you find is that the 160 milligram dose had the best effect. Uh, uh, as you can see, um, uh, it produced a, a significant difference from the placebo group. It is interesting to note, actually, uh, to go back, the MFAR score um, increases with increasing severity of neuro neurological illness. It, it decreases with the improvement in neurological illness. And interestingly, as you see, there is a placebo effect. Even the patients who are not treated with the OMA had some improvement over 12 weeks, but the improvement was much more in the 160 milligram age group and less so in the 80 milligram age group. And this is another plot, which also shows that when you get it at 300 milligrams, the effect goes away. So this is the best improvement at 160 milligrams per day in a short trial in a small number of subjects. Can I have the next slide, please? So based on that experience, uh, it was decided to do a large-scale double-blind placebo control study. Of course, this was organized by Riata, the pharmaceutical company. Uh, patients were divided into two groups, the placebo arm, the OMAV. Uh, the dose picked was 150 milligram based on the part one study. And the patients were followed for a longer period of time, up to 48 weeks. And this, th these results have been just published. Can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, so wh what I'm showing you is the important result. Uh, the primary outcome measure for this study was actually the MFAR score. And that's what you see right here. And again, to remind you, if the MFAR scores gets lower, the patient is doing better from a neurological perspective. If it gets higher, uh, it is worsening. So, uh, so this is the baseline. And what you see here is both the groups, placebo as well as drug group, decline for about 12 weeks. This clearly, again, is a placebo response, as we saw with the first study. But then they start uh, uh, differing from each other, as you can see. You can see the placebo arm starts worsening. And at the end of the study, they were about 1.55 points worse than uh, the baseline. 
uh, and you can see uh, the the um, treated arm was much better. So for a total difference of about 2.4 points, it's a statistically significant. So there was a statistically significant um, uh, improvement in the MFAR score in the treated arm compared to the placebo arm. And this shows some more details of this. Uh, oops, uh, these are all the subjects. Uh, if, you, if you see, uh, what you see here is that we had learned from the first phase of the trial that uh, patients who have foot deformity often do not do as well as patients who do not have a foot deformity. As you can see here, these are patients who did not have a foot deformity, like a high arch foot. And this, the, these are the ones with the foot deformity. Children, there are 20 of these children in this study, did a whole lot better than the, the entire group, if you will. So children seem to have better effects. So this shows the results just in children. This is seven children who got the placebo and these are 13 children who got the drug. And you see that there's even bigger difference than in the whole group. And so this is the first positive result, if you will, in a double blind trial with uh, free drugs ataxia. Can I have the next slide, please? And some more details, I don't wanna to go, to, go into the details of it, but you can see that many other things improved as well. The clinical impression of the patient, the clinician's uh, impression of the patient during the trial the timed walk test improved, the frequency of falls improved, and we also did activities of daily living. So we score items like speech and ba bathing and, and dressing, personal hygiene and, and so forth. And you can see that in all of these, there is a decline in score. And of course, this means improvement. So it is not just the total MFAR scores. Several items that we are measuring were better on the RTA408 or OMOF. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I will not belabor this slide too much. So uh, we are very excited about the RTA408. I hear that uh, Riata is uh, uh, looking at these results, probably talking to FDA, and we'll not wait and see uh, if we hear any more news on this. Um, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Now, um, People have thought about handling iron and chelating iron out, and this has not really worked. The, the way the cells handle an iron in free drugs is quite complex. This is again showing you a cell. This is mitochondria. You've got this iron excess sitting here because it's not being used to make the iron sulfur cluster proteins. And interestingly enough, the mitochondria tell the cell, hey, we, don't, uh, we are not making the iron sulfur cluster, and the cell thinks that it needs more iron, so it starts pulling in more iron. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. And in fact, there's excess iron coming in from the, from the blood into the cell, even though there's more iron sitting in the mitochondria because the mitochondria feel that uh, we don't have enough iron because it's not making the iron sulfur cluster. So there's a complex series of changes. And the compound that has been tried um, most is a chelating agent called deferiprone. Uh, chelating agents have been around, and iron chelation is a commonly used uh, treatment for patients with sickle cell disease who get a lot of, lot of blood transfusion, get an iron overload. So what you see, uh, we, a number of open-label studies were done with very variable results, and there was a large multiple-dose study. And uh, unfortunately, with the larger doses, actually the neurological function got worse. So obviously, these compounds have multiple effects on the brain and the system. So it was not a good experience. It also has uh, concerns for blood, blood toxicity with these drugs like deferiprone. The new drug in terms of iron handling is called AP743. It's now called PTC743. It inhibits an enzyme called lipooxygenase. And this enzyme uh, triggers uh, the cell death that occurs with increased iron, this is called ferroptosis. That this term is used to indicate cell death, that cell death that is caused by iron. Small studies have shown some encouraging results, and I am hearing from PTC that there is a double-blind placebo-controlled study on the way for a, a PTC743. Can I have the next slide, please? We talked about the epigenetics. We talked about how the histones kind of cluster around the promoter, close off the gene, the promoter, so that the, the gene cannot be activated. We talked about the fact that the lack of acetyl molecules uh, is, is, a, is a problem here. And if you can improve the acetylation of these histones, you can open up this chromatin or heterochromatin, uh, the histones, and this will allow for the production of uh, uh, more mRNA and more protein. And you can do this with a number of molecules called HDAC inhibitors. HDAC stands for histone deacetylase. So these are uh, enzymes that take off the acetyl molecule. And if you can inhibit those enzymes, 
uh, you will be able to uh, perhaps open up the chromatin and open up the gene. Um, uh, interestingly, there are a large number of HDAC inhibitors. Some of them are known medications, like lithium, for example, is an HDAC inhibitor, as is Depakote, which is used in epilepsy, is an HDAC inhibitor. But there are also many, many histones and many, many ways of uh, adding or, or subtracting acetyl molecules from these histones. So you have to screen a large number of these molecules to try and find the best one for Friedreichsataxia. And this has been done primarily by the laboratory of Dr. Garisfeld in San Diego. And finally, they identified a compound called 109. They called it compound 109. And um, this, was, this seemed to be the most promising. And it got a very small trial that was published in 2014. And I show you a couple of pictures. As you can see, this was just four patients. Uh, they were exposed to the drug only for about four or five days, 148 hours, uh, and then uh, there were placebo arm and a uh, treated arm. And what this here shows you is a measurement, I believe, in the peripheral blood cells of fratexin mRNA. And you can see with the drug, the mRNA does go up, uh, as it does not in, in the placebo. You can see it in each of these patients. Uh, the protein measurements, fratexin protein was also measured, was not as impressive as the mRNA measurements. So this was an encouraging result, proof of concept, that if you inhibit HDAC, you might be able to improve protection production. Compound 109, unfortunately, was, uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, was not taken into future additional trials. It has some toxicity. Uh, it, it does not get in the cells very well. And what I'm showing here is the attempt that uh, drug companies are still, I think, Biomare and is still involved in um, optimizing these HDAC inhibitors. And we anticipate that the strategy of uh, improving the epigenetics and making more fratexin is still going to be in trial sometime in the near future. Can I have the next slide, please? So a number of other strategies, and I know people have talked about this and people have inquired about these. Uh, many of these molecules that are shown here, erythropoietin, gamma interferon, etrovirine, have been found by what we call high throughput screening Basically, laboratories take a large number of drugs that are already known to medicine and, and kind of squirt it on uh, cells uh, with free drugs, ataxia cells, to see if any one of them increases protection production. And the uh, gamma interferon trial was not particularly successful, did not lead us into uh, to any results. Erythropoietin similarly has not had a, uh, um, enough of an effect to, to, to get to approval. And on the right side, I show you a number of papers that have been published recently that look at some very exciting strategies. This is a paper describing, for example, gene editing uh, with something like CRISPR-Cas. Um, um, there are the, the sticky DNA that we talked about that gums up the promoter area can potentially be uh, reversed by a group of compounds called oligonucleotides. These are called antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. And there is increasing clinical experience with ASOs and many other genetic disorders. So this is a strategy that's still being developed to see if an ASO can reverse the, the DNA configuration, uh, allowing better fratexin production. Uh, uh, synthetic things that can uh, overcome the, the problem with the GAA repeat are also being developed. And finally, uh, this interesting thing called a fusion protein. So in general, it is difficult to put a protein directly into uh, any organism, including human beings. You cannot inject proteins or you cannot put it into your diet. Uh, I mean, you can, but the, 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 the way the, the a particular protein like fratexin will get destroyed into its uh, component amino acid. So it's not gonna be preserved as the protein you want. But uh, an interesting group of compounds have come up. These are called self-penetrating peptides. These are short protein molecules that have the ability to kind of preserve itself in circulation and then be able to enter the cells through the cell membrane. Um, and so um, Dr. Payne's laboratory, for example, had the clever idea of fusing a cell penetrating peptide called the TAT protein with fratexin. So these two are fused together in a genetically engineered way. And now he is able to inject this into intact organisms and be able to let it get into cells. It can actually get into the mitochondria. And then the fratexin comes out and makes the mature fratexin is able to work uh, in a fratexin deficient model. So this is an exciting um, uh, avenue. And uh, there is an early trial with a fusion protein, CT1601 that began dosing uh, last December, but has been kind of held back because of COVID pandemic. And we expect some early safety tolerability results from this study, hopefully in the next year. So this is really exciting. If you're able to get enough fratexin into your system, 
you should be able to do uh, much, you know, much better than targeting some of the down downstream pathway. But uh, the problems with these strategies are, you know, can you get the protein into uh, where it needs to go and, and, and in how much amount and so on and so forth. So this study has just begun. Can I have the next slide, please? And I want to talk a little bit about direct gene replacement. Of course, that'll be the most exciting way, if it's possible, if it can do it in the right way, to get the gene into the system, and, and then you be able to make enough of the frataxin uh, um, to rescue the cells that are affected by frataxataxia. Uh, the problem with gene, uh, genes is again the same as proteins. You cannot uh, inject uh, the naked gene uh, DNA into uh, human beings or any organism. It'll, it'll get destroyed by enzymes. So you have to put the gene in what we call a vector. So you need a vector to carry the gene into the system. And there are a number of different vectors that have been thought about and been worked on. And um, I have the, I have the uh, fortune of working with uh, Dr. Barry Byrne and Dr. Manu Korti, who um, organized the Powell Gene Therapy Center here at UF. So uh, whatever I speak of, and my knowledge comes from talking to these experts in gene therapy. Um, uh, earlier on, 20, 25 years ago, they used the, the virus called the adenovirus, which is a cold virus, to put the genes back, uh, but it had toxicity, so the, the field was held back till we recognized the possibility that we can use a virus called adeno-associated virus, AAV. So this is just a cartoon of an AAV, and what you see, it's spiky things on the, on the outside. Um, uh, and again, people have become virologists since the COVID epidemic has started. These, this is the protein capsid that encloses the viral DNA. The nice thing about AAV is that it is not toxic in moderate doses. You know, it doesn't produce disease in human beings. So you can give this to human beings without causing any direct disease. And what the clever people in the Gene Therapy Center do is, of course, to gut the DNA, gut the viral uh, genes out of the system and then put the gene of interest that we call a transgene. Um, in the case of free drugs ataxia, the frataxin gene is put into the virus. These, uh, these are called inverted terminal repeats. These are the two ends of the viral um, genome right here. This gives you a little bit more detail. Here is the gene of interest that you put in the, in the viral genome and is encased in the capsid, which is the protein part of the virus. Uh, you can inject it into the blood uh, or wherever you want to inject it. It gets picked up by the cell, by this little outputting, and this kind of breaks off and forms this little, uh, what we call endosome. Uh, the virus is still in there. Uh, the cell has an ability to open it up and the virus is released. Of course, the virus contains the gene that you're interested in putting back into the, into the human being. And then eventually um, it actually goes through a nucle nuclear pore complex. This is the nucleus. So this is the cytoplasm. This is the nucleus. Uh, as you all know, it is in the, within the nucleus where all the genetic action is. And then uh, when it gets into the nucleus, the virus gets uncoated. The protein capsid goes away. And here you have the gene of interest. Now, another good thing about AAB is it is what we call a non-integrating virus. So this uh, virus does not get attached to the human genome. It kind of stays away in the form of what we call a, like a, 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 a separate entity. And this uh, gene now uh, within the viral uh, uh, context, but the human gene can sit in the nucleus and start putting out, putting out the protein. So it will make a copy of the, the, the gene mRNA. It'll come out and make the protein. In a non-dividing cell like a nerve cell, so nerve cells don't divide and are like, for example, blood cells. So in the case of blood cells, if you put this in, of course, once the blood cells are divided and then destroyed, uh, the viral DNA will go away. But now in a non-dividing cell, this uh, transgene that you put in there can stay for a long period of time. And we still don't know how long it will last, but theoretically, after one injection, it could last for the entire life of the individual in a non-dividing cell. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is the construct that the Powell Gene Therapy Center here at uh, UF uh, ha have developed. Uh, what you see here is the, the inverted terminal repeats of the virus. The human frataxin gene is put in the context uh, after gutting out the viral uh, genes. Uh, it has got a promoter. Uh, this promoter is picked to make sure that this can activate the gene in multiple tissues because in the case of Friedrich's ataxia, 
we want to get the gene in and make it active in, in the brain, in different parts of the brain, in different parts of the spinal cord, in different parts of the system, such as the pancreas and the heart. So this is called the chick, chicken beta actin promoter. Uh, it has some regulatory elements. And one of the problems is uh, certainly even though it's non-toxic, the higher the dose, the more likely that you'll have some toxicity. So how do we limit the dose? You know, how do you, and so we need to still figure out what the dose of these viral um, uh, delivery would be. But the strategy that we are developing is to do a combined systemic delivery and uh, put in some of the genes, uh, the AAB virus into the spinal fluid at the same time. So uh, intravenous shot, as well as an intrathecal shot into the spinal fluid to get to, to various parts of the brain and the spinal cord and primarily the heart and other tissues that may be affected in Friedreich's ataxia. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So current studies in the laboratory include, uh, we have models, for example, we have something called a mouse knockout model where the gene has been knocked out in the heart and these mice get the cardiomyopathy that you can get with ataxia, And you can see that the survival of these animals is improved uh, if, you, if you inject them with the AAV9 protection after you knock out the protection gene in, in the heart. There are rat studies that are going on that primarily to look at the biodistribution. Where, is, where does it end up? Does it go to the heart? Does it go to the brain? And, and, and things like that. And also we, are, uh, we have completed a large number of non-human primate studies in monkeys to see, first of all, is it toxic and is it getting in the different parts of the brain uh, when we do this combined injection of uh, peripheral injection as well as intrathecal injection. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and this is just a, another quick example. The mice that are knocked out lose weight, but if you can rescue the weight loss in these uh, animals by providing the protection in a AAV9 uh, uh, vector, the, the gene. So gene therapy rescues the weight loss in these animals. So we're developing these early preclinical results with gene therapy. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, yeah. So in the last few slides, uh, there are a number of difficulties, of course. These are not easy things to do. And, uh, and uh, uh, one of the problems we face with any of these viruses and other kinds of novel therapies is uh, toxicity and related to immune response. And again, this is a topic that's dis uh, discussed a lot in the COVID-19 atmosphere, uh, how much you know, immune response you get. But the problem in gene therapy is when you get an immune response against the AAV, uh, it can cause toxicity. So if there is an in intense immune response to a large dose, you can get inflammation, you can get liver problems or platelet problems and things like that. So we had to work that out a little bit more. Um, in, in addition to that, if you, if you have an immune response, it may not allow the gene to be expressed. Uh, so you may lose the effectiveness of the gene that you're putting, putting back. With a the therapeutic protein replacement, you might have a similar problem. Uh, will there, is there gonna be an immune response or not? And one of the problems with gene therapy right now is uh, it's not easy to do a, a, a more than one dose. So we, we have to take the best shot and try to get the gene everywhere we can, because once you give it, you are gonna get an immune response and a repeat dosing may not be easy. And strategies are being developed to figure out if we can do repeat dosing. We still don't know how much dose to be employed. You know, we need to use a safe dose, but we need to use an effective dose. Uh, we still need to be sure of where we want to get the protection, uh, in what part of the spinal cord, in what part of the cerebellum, does the cerebral cortex needs to be transduced, as we call it. Do we need to put the protection in every part of the brain? We cannot assume that if you put it in the spinal fluid that it's going to get everywhere. So that is, those are things that, that, are, that need to be still being worked out. The right time and uh, the general concept in neurology is that the earlier you treat patients, the better it will be. But still, we don't know. Um, you know, when does uh, the problem become more difficult to to reverse? We worry about overexpression. If you put too much protection, can it be toxic? And one of the funny things about uh, gene therapy is what we call therapeutic commitment. Unlike other interventions like drugs, you can stop the drug if you feel that there's a side effect. But with the gene therapy, uh, it is going to be in the cell and you cannot get it out. So this is a problem, it's called therapeutic commitment. And then of course, uh, the enormous costs involved and the manufacturing process are all barriers. Can I have the next slide, please? And I want to finish up with a few uh, slides on clinical research and clinical trials. 
Um, and I think many of you participate in such trials and know probably a lot more about this than I do. And you, you look at it from your point of view and many physicians like me may not completely um, understand the thought processes that, that go into this. Clearly, it's a voluntary process. You need to provide informed consent and uh, you don't have to participate in research, but it's a voluntary process. And, um, and we do thank all the patients and families that participate in research. As you probably have already learned, there are observational studies and interventional studies. Interventional studies are things like drug trials, maybe a physical therapy intervention or some kind of intervention. But there are also observational studies which plot the natural history of the disease. And this is very important because these observational studies give us the kind of data that we need to design clinical trials. Because in clinical trials, uh, we want to do the studies most efficiently. And in order to do that, we need these observational data. Because there is research data and clinical data um, in our center, we try to do the research visits separate from clinical visits, but then that may not be so in every place. Uh, but uh, research data, you know, con confidentiality of research data is very important, and we try to preserve it. But as you know, there is always a concern about that. In a drug trial, open label studies where everybody gets a particular intervention. The regulatory agencies do not like this. Uh, you saw the placebo effect with some of the trials. So generally, you need to do a placebo control study, and this can be quite difficult with a disease like prerexataxia. In addition to that, inclusion exclusion criteria. So every trial has a certain rule. So just having FA does not qualify you for a FA study because there are certain other rules. You may have to be able to walk, or you may not have to have heart disease, and so on and so forth. Obviously, when you decide to participate, you need to look at the length of the trial, the number of visits, travel issues, missing work, missing school, et cetera, et cetera. And even though most trials are funded by grants, uh, I'm sure you, know, you have some cost involved, for example, missing work, um, et cetera, or picking up a dinner somewhere along the way. Um, you got to consider the side effects. And uh, in many trials, if there is a significant side effect that requires uh, hospital care or physician care, we often say insurance companies have to take care of it. So you need to kind of look at those things when you decide to participate in trials. Can I have the next slide, please? There are some barriers from the clinical side that we are still facing. We need to have what we call clinical outcome assessments or clinical outcome measures. Uh, we heard about these neurological scores. These are not very, uh, very sensitive. Change is too slow. It's very variable. So we have problems with these. Uh, we are developing something called patient reported outcome measures. So how do we question patients uh, uh, and uh, get their um, input on what the disease is doing to them. And this can be used as a measure of disease uh, modification by a drug, for example. And we are working on biomarkers, which are uh, uh, quantitative measures. These are things that you can actually put a number on very precisely, like MRI scans or imaging. So for example, right now, as you may have heard, we uh, uh, six centers, uh, three in the US, one in Germany, one in Australia, and one in South America, in Brazil, are collaborating on a large study called TRAC-FA, which is going to look at the MRI of the spinal cord and the brain, as well as a number of other measures of disease progression in free drugs, the taxia. And there are fluid measurements. We like to have very good method to measure for taxin and, and so on and so forth. And I put the question mark patient recruitment because uh, we, you know, we are seeing so many studies and so many drug studies and we need to be able to recruit a sufficient number of patients. So with patients can get exhausted by uh, listening about drug trials. And then there are useful websites uh, that you can consult. And again, many that you already know about. Next slide, please. And maybe the last one. Uh, so my conclusions are we have come a long way from gene discovery to possible meaningful therapies. I think neuroprotective therapies will uh, will be very effective, will have a significant impact when we learn how to do it right. Uh, these are novel strategies, including gene therapy, but these, because they're novel, they also have uncertain types of side effects and uncertain types of problems which you need to recognize. And all of them may not be clearly visible with preclinical studies alone. So we have to, we have to be very careful with these studies. Uh, so there are barriers still to be overcome, but I believe that the free drug community has shown that there is tremendous teamwork between families, patient organizations, 
researchers, regulatory agencies, and clinicians. And I'm absolutely certain that these barriers will be overcome. I want to stop there and um, I apologize for some of the technical glitches. And I'm more than happy to answer questions now, or I'm sure Michelle may be able to share some questions with me later on. Um, and I'm happy to answer them at a later time as well. Thank you, Dr. Supermoni, for your presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat box. I know we did have a few technical difficulties, so if you have the time, Dr. Supermoni, we'd love to get a few questions asked and answered. Absolutely. One question has come in. Uh, does gene therapy impact someone's ability to take part in future clinical trials? I really don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, generally, as you know, um, most clinical trials will say if you are, uh, if you are, if you have received another experimental intervention within a certain period of time, we don't want you in that trial. Uh, and so that's a fascinating question. I didn't even think of it uh, before, because gene therapy obviously is a trial. Once you do it, you're in the trial all through your life, presumably. Uh, because it, could, it, it theoretically will have an effect for a long period of time. We don't know that if it's real or not. So uh, I don't know how that's going to shape up. Um, I, uh, uh, I think the research clinical investigators and pharmaceutical companies will probably design ways. And, and, and we do, you know, in other fields, we have done combined trials. You know, in other words, use an existing drug that already is effective and then add on another drug to see if it has got a more effect. So I, I would think that that's likely that to be able to participate in more trials, but we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Another question has come in. How has COVID-19 impacted FA research? Yeah, um, certainly it held back a number of the observational studies uh, in, in terms of centers. Uh, you know, the, the, around the world, this has been uh, different. Uh, we just had a conference call on the track FA study last uh, couple of days ago. And it was clear that uh, in the US, uh, we are a bit more open in spite of uh, our current situation in terms of drugs, I mean, um, research studies. For example, at the University of Florida, we have allowed subjects to come and the UF uh, authorities have opened up our research facility. So we are able to get patients in, we are careful. Uh, but other places like Australia and Europe, for example, uh, their lockdown um, rules are much stricter. So uh, they may not be able to recruit subjects as quickly as we're doing. And, and of course, the situation can change. Um, I don't know what else. I mean, I, I, am I, I'm not the most expert in pharmaceutical industry. I suspect that the financial issues have probably have had some impact. Uh, but I don't know that uh, that for sure, and uh, you know the financial impact of COVID on various things, including um, pharmaceutical industry and patient organizations, is something we need to think about. Great. Another question: Is there any specific diets, vitamins, or supplements that FA patients should take or be on? Frankly, I have not done that with my patients, but as I you know, I mean, some of our patients do take, continue to take idibinone. And if you're going to take something, idibinone and thiamine, because those are easily available, uh, potentially not particularly toxic. The other antioxidants are more difficult. Idibinone is difficult to get as well in the U.S. Uh, one of the problems with these antioxidants is the dose. Um, uh, in the, in the later studies on idibinone, they used doses like uh, 1,300 milligrams a day, which is pretty large dose and uh, not supported by insurance. So it becomes expensive if you get it from other countries like Canada or Europe. Um, vitamin B1, what is what you could try it. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in. Feel free to ask any more questions while we finish up this presentation. I would like to thank our presenter today, Dr. Subramoni. 
sincerely appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do for the FA community. During this presentation, Dr. Supermoni mentioned clinical trials and research. If you have any questions about clinical trials or would like to learn more about clinical trials and research, MDA has recently created a clinical trial series that includes webinars and education materials. I've added the link to the chat in case anyone is interested in learning more. If you have any questions about this webinar, feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow up with you. Also, we would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. A web page will pop up with a short survey on today's webinar. I've also added the survey link in the chat box. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar on Frederick's ataxia. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Dr. Supermoni, for presenting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. You.